The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Liz Purnell, an Education and Training Specialist with the Institute of Child Nutrition. Welcome to the Team Up Thursday's webinar on creative ways to boost flavor with less sodium. The Institute of Child Nutrition, along with its Applied Research Division, has collaborated with USDA to develop Team Up for School Nutrition Success. Team Up is a unique learning experience designed to enhance the operation of school nutrition programs. It provides tailored technical assistance to programs that want to maintain a healthy environment and increase student meal program participation. As a follow-up to the Team Up pilot workshops back in 2014, a monthly webinar series was launched. It serves as a platform to further enhance partnerships and to provide an opportunity for all school nutrition professionals to discuss issues and provide solutions and best practices used by districts in key areas. The ICN has created a website for all materials and resources specifically related to Team Up. You can find the information at www.theicn.org slash Team Up. Today's webinar will feature a panel of experts who will share strategies and best practices for reducing the sodium in school meals without compromising flavor. As we kick off the webinar, USDA will share some information about their What's Shaking initiative and provide information on what resources are currently available to help with improving school meals. We will also hear from two new school nutrition directors and an executive chef who will share their tips and strategies for boosting the flavor of school meals. I'm pleased to briefly introduce our panelists. We have Erica Pija, who will start us off today. She is a Senior Technical Advisor with USDA Food and Nutrition Service. Next, we will hear from Lisa Griffin and Callie Fowler-Farish. Lisa is the Director of Child Nutrition, and Callie is the Executive Chef, both from Union Public Schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Misha James, Nutrition Services Director for Monterey Peninsula Unified School District in Monterey, California will speak next. And lastly, I will wrap it up with a few announcements. During today's webinar, all attendees are muted. There will be time for questions following each speaker's presentation. If you have a question, please type it in the question box on your screen. Now, Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. And hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to join today's panel and provide an overview of the work that we do at USDA's Food and Nutrition Service to support a healthier school environment. My name is Erica Pijai, and I am the Senior Nutrition Advisor in Child Nutrition Programs at USDA's Food and Nutrition Service. And one of my roles is to oversee the agency Sodium Reduction Initiative, which I'll tell you more about later. So um, by the end of this webinar, you will know more about sodium consumption among children, the top 10 salty foods in children's diets, and what we at USDA are doing in terms of our focus on our National Sodium Reduction Initiative. And all of the speakers today will share with you some real strategies schools across the nation are employing to achieve sodium reduction in school meals and show you where you can access some of the resources, materials, tools uh, for school settings and school nutrition professionals. So diving right in to talk about sodium, this graph depicts the average child's calorie and sodium intake. The 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends a maximum of 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. And on average, 2- to 19-year-olds are consuming 700 more sodium than the recommended daily maximum amount of sodium. So 700 milligrams more than the recommendation. And you can see here that there is an upward trend in the amount of sodium that's consumed as children get older, with 12 to 19 year olds consuming about 1,100 milligrams more sodium than the recommended maximum amount. So this goes to show that it's incredibly important to make sure that the youngest children who are beginning to form taste palates and preferences, that they do not grow up to prefer salty foods. And the school environment is one environment that can impact this. 
sodium reduction is just one piece of the puzzle as we work towards healthier school meals. And just a little bit of history here, in December of 2010, Congress reauthorized the child nutrition programs through the passage of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And this act specifically charged the USDA with revamping the nutrition standards of our school lunch and school breakfast program. And then in January of 2012, the USDA released the final rule for the updated nutrition standards, which were based on the recommendations from the National Academy of Medicine and were rooted in the science of the dietary guidelines for Americans. So since then, the nutrition standards for school meals were implemented using a phased-in approach so that school meals now contain more whole grains uh, and a greater variety of fruits and vegetables. They include only fat-free and low-fat types of milk. They have um, less sodium and saturated fat and are balanced meals with the right size portions for children. And schools across the country are doing an incredible job with making changes to school meals and they're employing some really innovative strategies to reduce the sodium content of their meals. So you'll hear a little bit later from Lisa, Callie, and Misha who will share with you their amazing stories. So recent data indicates that about 10% of children's daily sodium intake comes from the school cafeteria, and the remaining 90% comes from foods obtained at stores, fast food and pizza restaurants, restaurants with wait staff, and more. So while the 10% uh, from schools may not seem like a lot, the amount of sodium that children consume from school meals is significant, and it does impact their overall sodium intake. So this um, information and this data then leads to the question, well, what foods are contributing to this excess um, sodium intake? And interestingly enough, our children's sodium intake is not attributable to the salt shaker. And instead, the majority of sodium is coming from popular foods that our kids love to eat and will typically consume in large quantities. And according to the CDC, 48% of sodium consumed by children comes from the 10 food subcategories shown here on this slide. So with the exception of plain milk, which naturally contains sodium, the top 10 food categories that contribute to American school children's sodium intake during the 22, um, 2011 to 2012 comprise the foods in which sodium is added during processing or preparation. The USDA Food and Nutrition Service is committed to sodium reduction and creating healthier school environments. So we are leading a national collaborative sodium reduction initiative to bolster support for lower, lowering sodium in school meals. And this initiative is called What's Shaking? Creative Ways to Boost Flavor with Less Sodium. What's Shaking involves everything from best practice webinars with local schools sharing their stories to engaging youth to speak on behalf of their peers about the importance of having healthy meals in schools. Our What's Shaking partners include those national associations, organizations, food industry, and trade associations that are working in the school and child health and wellness space. And thus far, nearly 45 partners have signed on to the initiative. All of these partners have committed to sharing information, resources, and best practices for sodium reduction in school meals and at home. Through What's Shaking, we are working with our USDA regional offices, state agencies, and partners to lift up the outstanding work being done in schools across the country. To highlight these items, you'll see here that we've created a What's Shaking website. And this website is a hub that links to various resources on sodium reduction and healthier school meals. It also provides background information on the What's Shaking initiative. And if you scroll down from the home page, you will see that the website is laid out in sections which pertain to specific audiences like school nutrition professionals, school administrators, teachers, staff, and parents and caregivers and students. So there's also a section on sodium reports and research where you can find more information on the scientific literature which speaks to sodium consumption among children. There's also a calendar of events where we link to our archive webinars on sodium. And now let's take a minute to delve into some of the resources we have available for school nutrition professionals. You will find various resources on menu planning, culinary techniques, sample menus, and recipes from the USDA partner organizations and state agencies. So for example, you'll be able to access Indiana Department of Education's two-page handout for modifying recipes that use high sodium ingredients and a chart of common seasonings to use in place of salt. You'll also find Iowa's flavor shakers, which are low sodium herb seasoning mixtures that can be used in schools to boost the flavor without adding sodium. And Kansas State Department of Education has three-week cycle menus that meet um, the sodium target one for lunch and breakfast. And there's much more that you can find on the What's Shaking website. 
We also link to our What's Shaking infographic for school nutrition professionals, and this infographic depicts the importance of sodium reduction and provides tips on reducing the sodium content of school meals. So let's take a closer look at the four best practice strategies on this infographic. The first tip that we provide is to use herbs and spices. Many schools are getting creative and in incorporating flavor stations where students can add flavor to their food without adding the sodium. And Jessica Shelley, the food service director at Cincinnati Public Schools, added a spice station to the end of each vegetable topping and salad bar. And on this station, she put various spices, herbs, peppers, and in some cases, flavored vinegars. And because all of these products were low and no sodium and had no calories, students could use as much as they wanted. And they did, and they loved it. And individual portion control packets of flavorings are, would also be an option here. We've heard about other districts around the country that are doing this too, such as Cloverleaf School District in Ohio, where Carrie Beagle shared that they even get students involved in inventing new herb blends and voting on fun names. So when taking sodium out of meals, it's important that we focus on what can be served, and what can be served are flavorful, colorful, and delicious. And one way to keep students on their toes is to explore new recipes or modify existing recipes. And there's many ways to do this, including reducing salt in recipes by half and conducting taste tests for acceptability. Schools can also use low sodium bouillon cubes, ham bases, chicken bases, replace broths and recipes with low sodium broth. They can also use less or no salt when cooking pasta, rice, beans, and hot cereals. If you're looking for delicious kid-friendly recipes for school meals or even at home, check out USDA's What's Cooking website where you can find recipes in both English and Spanish. Recipes come in household sizes that yield six servings and also large quantity recipes for schools in quantities uh, of 25, 50, and 100 servings per recipe. These recipes have all been standardized to provide crediting information for the meal pattern requirements and include a nutrition analysis. There's also videos showing how to make some of our recipes, like chick penne pasta or eagle pizza. We've also been busy redeveloping some USDA recipes and creating new regional and ethnic recipes for use in schools, which can be found at the website at the bottom of the screen. And in total, 200 new recipes are being modernized and standardized to ensure consistent meals and credited to include the vegetable subgroups. And these recipes feature whole grain dishes like rice pilaf, baking powder biscuits, main dishes like taco salad and chicken noodles, and ethnic flavors and vegetable dishes like Mexicali corn, Chinese vegetables, and orange glazed carrots. On our website, you'll find our very popular recipes for healthy kids cookbooks with yields ranging from six servings all the way up to 100 servings. And there's 30 recipes in total and have fun names like oodles of noodles and vegetable chili boat. This is absolutely my favorite cookbook. So for strategy number three, we also let schools know that they already have access to many low sodium options through USDA Foods. And USDA Foods offers a variety of no salt added and lower sodium options to help schools prepare healthy meals. Their unseasoned grilled chicken strips and minimally seasoned pulled pork are quite popular with schools who use them as a base to add their own flavors for tacos or sandwiches and other entree dishes. And you can see the foods available list for school year 2017 and 18 at the web link on the screen here. And lastly, we mentioned the important step of staying in contact with food vendors. Schools can require that vendors provide them with sodium information or a list of sodium options and other similar products to compare. The DOD Fresh program is another option for obtaining fresh produce. And these items are not processed and as a result are typically lower in sodium than similar alternatives. We've heard from many schools that have achieved sodium reduction or are meeting the sodium standards. And some of the common things that schools are doing include providing more culinary training for staff, starting to do more cooking from scratch or speed scratch, where you start with ready-made products like tomato sauce and add in fresh ingredients to the dish. Schools are also reformulating recipes and incorporating more spices to enhance flavors. They're seeking out reduced sodium versions of popular items like salad dressing, soups, cheeses, and sauces. And some really cool things, um, some schools are whipping up their own low-sodium salad dressings using Greek yogurt as a creamy base. And Detroit Public Schools in Michigan, they've developed vinaigrettes and salad dressings using fruit purees that have replaced their ranch dressing on their menus. So that's really boosted their fresh vegetable consumption. 
Successful schools are also attending food shows and working with vendors on a regular basis. They're slowly reducing the sodium levels item by item over the school year, over you know, many years. And they're also performing taste tests to gather student input on the menus. These two pictures were shared by Scott at the, um, he's the director of food service for Turlock Unified School District in California. And these photos demonstrate what he's doing to help lower the sodium in his meals and get his students to eat more fresh food. So his district is working to market the image of fresh in his school meals. And he's doing this by setting up farm stands like you see here on the left and quick stops like here on the right. And because he knew that his students had a tendency to eat more packaged high sodium items for snack, he set up these stands to change the snack culture within the district. So in terms of what's next from USDA, we're currently in the development stage of a series of tip sheets that can be used by school nutrition professionals that are focused on a variety of sodium reduction related topic areas. So these tip sheets will be short and user friendly. Um, that'll include real actionable strategies and best practices from real school school districts um, to not only assist with sodium reduction, but also to boost the flavor of school meals. So the tip sheets will include valuable information, strategies, and highlight stories from schools across the nation. So I encourage you to check out the What's Shaking website for more information um, in the future. We'll also be hearing, um, actually, it's sort of a call for success stories now. So we love hearing stories from schools that are implementing innovative strategies to lower the sodium of their meals while boosting flavor. So if you know of any stories or have a story to share, please, please email us. Um, and we plan to continue to collaborate with our What's Shaking partners to increase access to our resources and elevate schools and districts that are achieving sodium reduction by highlighting them on webinars like today or in our um, blogs and newsletters and so on. Also, what's next, if you're headed to Atlanta for the School Nutrition Association's annual national conference, um, please plan to attend these two sodium-related sessions. So our Sunday session will feature two school nutrition directors who've done some innovative things to reduce the sodium and boost the flavor of their school meals. And our Monday session will be highly interactive. It'll be a round table where you can join USDA representatives and also seasoned school nutrition directors um, as we share strategies for lower sodium menu planning, procurement, all of that. And you'll leave with fresh menu ideas and strategies that you can use in your own program. So we hope to see you there. And if not, please let your colleagues know and help us spread the word about these two sodium-related sessions. And remember, USDA is here to help, so we want to hear about your successes and your challenges. If you have stories to share, you can see our email address here at teamnutrition at fns.usda.gov. Please also follow us on Twitter for any updates and news about our latest and greatest resources available from Team Nutrition. And that's it from me, and I'm going to go through some of the questions that have come in through the tool. Um, so it says, when do you expect the Recipes for Healthy Kids cookbook for schools to be back in stock in hard copy? Um, when, whenever they're back in stock, they will be um, posted on the or resource order form. So you can, I'm sorry, you keep checking back, but you can check back there. We're also in the process of um, standardizing all of our um, USDA recipes, so you'll see those posted to our website. Um, the final collection will have 200 new recipes, and we've been posting them incrementally, so you'll see those on our website as well. Okay, thank you everybody. And now I will turn it over to Lisa Griffin, who is joining us from Union Public Schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, this is Lisa Griffin, and I'm the Director of Child Nutrition at Union Public Schools. And um, I'm just gonna get this. I've been uh, uh, in child nutrition for 33 years, so I guess you could consider me a lifer, and I love it. And I'm very excited to be able to have this opportunity to share with you some of our solutions to lowering sodium in meals without sacrificing flavor. When the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act came out, I saw the regulations and menu changes that needed to occur, and I thought, I'm going to have to come up with some kind of ways to make our food taste better, or we will lose participation. And I'm sure you saw that coming, too. When you lower sodium, sugar, fat, and increase the fiber in meals, uh, this definitely affects the flavor and definitely the acceptance of foods by our students. And so seeing this coming, um, I, I contacted a chef, and we contracted with her to do some culinary boot camps with all of our employees. 
And in these culinary boot camps, we had um, sessions on flavoring, spices, herbs, uh, cooking methods to enhance flavors. And uh, then they had a secret basket that they had to cook different foods with all the different herbs and spices that they learned about. And they absolutely loved it and um, started transporting that to their real life work situations. So having that, that as a successful uh, endeavor, I decided we probably needed to hire on an executive chef. And you will be hearing from Callie fowler Farish a little bit after me about uh, some techniques and detailed information on how we lower sodium and add layers of flavor to our food here at Union Public Schools. We have 19 school sites uh, in Union, 13 are elementary, two middle, two high schools, an early childhood center, and an alternative ed school with 16,000 students and about 68% free and reduced students. Our average date of participation is about 10,000 lunches, 6,000 breakfasts, 500 supper meals, 1,000 snacks, and we participate in the fresh fruit and vegetable grant with about 4,500 a day. We offer summer meals, a la carte, and catering as well. In Union, we have 175 employees and three dietitians that are registered, uh, one executive chef, and three school chefs. We also do all of our preparation at our school sites. Um, nothing is brought in. We do it on site. And we also have a central warehouse that provides all of the food and supplies to our 19 different sites. We try to bring in current trends that are reinvented into our schools, trends such as mashups or street food or different cultural cuisines, because these all add some really neat flavors into our foods and uh, are student accepted in the fast food and restaurant world as well. We definitely try to keep things fresh, as was mentioned by Erica and other schools. If you, the more fresh you can use, the, the better the sodium, the lower the sodium will be. We purchase an awful lot of uh, produce from local farmers in the Farm to School program here. We have six different farmers that provide things like uh, heirloom tomatoes, sweet potatoes, different types of greens and lettuces, broccoli, cauliflower, beets, turnips, asparagus, blueberries, whole wheat flour. And so we feel really good because, again, those are a fresh source of food and no salt or sodium has been added to them. We also do a lot of baking in-house. Uh, we do uh, all of our, except for our sandwich breads, we do uh, our breads and uh, muffins and uh, Italian breads and such in-house. And another thing um, we do is let students customize their flavors by providing some different sauces. And we've had uh, recipes developed by our chefs that, that actually add some flavor so that they can make a customizable food. It can be used on uh, all of our different types of foods, things like Union uh, sauce, which is sort of like the Chick-fil-A sauce, campfire sauce, honey sriracha sauce, spicy Asian, just to give them a little bit different, different flavors. The first thing I'm going to cover is how do you lower sodium through purchasing? And we purchase, as I've mentioned, as much fresh food as possible, our fruits, vegetables, and herbs. And the next thing we look at, if we can't get it fresh, because of seasonal type things, we look at frozen vegetables because they are usually lower in sodium than canned vegetables. For example, corn frozen as well as green beans frozen compared to canned. You can see the numbers there. Frozen corn, um, the kind that we buy, was one milligram of sodium versus 214 milligrams per half cup. Well, that's a big savings when you look at a meal. And uh, that way you can invest more of the sodium in your entree to make it taste better. Uh, frozen green beans, 9 milligrams versus 260 in a canned uh, green bean. We also look at foods on our menus that are available with lower sodium levels and try to go for the lower sodium level type foods. And we do this through purchasing by writing specifications that identify which foods should be lower in sodium and the level of sodium that's expected. And we especially do that, we don't cook our beans from scratch, but we do a lot of scratch cooking, as we'll talk about later. But uh, our canned beans, we spec a low-sodium version, and usually it's 140 milligrams or less. And if you didn't get the low-sodium version, it would be 350. Again, a big savings in sodium there. 
The only canned vegetables that we purchase at Union are some green beans, because we do get the commodity uh, frozen green beans. Uh, we get some canned tomato products and some lower sodium beans. We also specify and purchase lower sodium uh, bases and broths and stocks and make our own stock. We uh, purchase lower sodium soy sauce and use hoisin sauce rather than oyster sauce in our Asian foods because it is a little lower in sodium. We purchase garlic, onion, and celery powders versus salts and actually we would prefer to use the fresh. We use a lot of fresh garlic, onion, and celery as seasonings. We also purchase seasoning mixes that do not contain MSG or where salt is not the primary ingredient. And that could be, for example, we make our own Italian seasonings and uh, Greek seasonings and that kind of uh, thing that doesn't have the salt. Another thing we look at is trying to always purchase high quality foods as much as possible because if you don't start out with high quality foods, you're not going to end up with high quality foods. And so we try to, to invest in our foods and make sure it's a top quality for our kids. We specify lower sodium meats and convenience foods. That's your bake, heat and serve foods. And uh, just the last couple of years, um, our turkey provider has been able to offer natural uncured deli meats, which are lower in sodium and still have a very nice flavor. So we're, we're glad to do that as well. We make sure that the herbs and spices that we have bought are no longer older than one year old because the spices sit on the shelf. They lose their flavor and develop a flat aroma and flavor. And so we try to make sure every year that we get new herbs and spices uh, that are you know, the dried version and make sure that they come in new for the next year. Another thing to look at as far as lowering sodium is in your menu planning. And we uh, do a lot of from scratch, probably at least 50 to 60 percent of our entrees are scratch because then you can control the amount of sodium in your food as well as other things like uh, fats and sugars. And it also uh, increase, you can increase the flavor in your from scratch or speed scratch cooking. When I'm writing the menus, I also look at trying to balance the from scratch items with the convenience items because you can then sort of control your sodium or average it out, as well as uh, looking at your labor. Uh, it, it helps you make your labor more consistent and more efficient in utilization when you have a from scratch item paired with a convenience item. If students really like an entree like um, cheese nachos, and our kids love cheese nachos, I didn't want to take it off. So I put it on the menu once a month, and they look forward to that. And then I put it, I try to put it on during a week. As you remember, you have to average uh, your menus for nutritional analysis for the week. And so I try to put it on the, the, the favorite higher sodium foods on a week that's uh, lower in sodium for entrees or sides so that the sodium total isn't too high. Also, we had to look when we got these sodium levels reduced that we had to look at our menus carefully and take off foods that were just impossible to keep the sodium levels where they needed to be or at least limit them. And that would be things like pickles and some condiments, uh, some hot dogs and some deli meats. But like I said, we have uh, found a very nice uh, un uncured natural deli meat. Now I'm going to turn it over to Callie and she'll give you some uh, more in-depth details about how we go about cooking and our recipes and that kind of thing to lower the sodium. Perfect. Well, as they said, my name is Callie Fowler. Um, I am the district executive chef for Union Public Schools um, and um, we as, as Lisa said, we like to focus a lot on flavor. Um, and with flavor is um, education, not only for our students, but also our staff. One way we do that is by exploring um, the palate and the um, how we taste things. So I have a cute picture up here of your tongue um, and where you taste things. Um, so on um, the tip of your tongue is sweet, um, then sour, salty, and then bitter in the back. So when I'm tasting food, not only with staff, but also students, we try to analyze um, 
what it needs or what it has too much of by that. And by adding um, the participation of the staff and the students, um, we are creating a lot of buy-in um, from them and they have, feel a little more empowered in choosing um, what they like to eat. Um, so we are always looking for new and interesting ingredients. Um, some of the things we use um, are sambal, which is a Indian chili paste. We use hoisin sauce, which is widely used in Asian cooking. Um, we make our own spice mixes just to make sure that they are very robust in flavor. Um, and then we incorporate a lot of different cuisines into our menu. Um, we serve everything from Korean and Mongolian to um, Greek uh, to um, Japanese to, you know, home cooking meals, which really provides um, a lot of choice for our students, um, and we get a lot of buy-in from that. Um, fusion is also a really big part of what we do. Um, we try to look at things um, that we're serving our students and try to make them as interesting as possible. Um, for instance, we do a chicken fried steak pizza, um, which our students go really wild for, or a buffalo chicken pizza, just to kind of switch it up, um, to kind of you know do a, a mashup or a mix up um, to, to not bore them at all. Um, so one of my big um, projects is writing recipes. Um, now when I first started out with child nutrition, it was really challenging. My background is actually um, fine dining. I was classically trained as a chef. Um, so it's been interesting to um, have to reduce a lot of the sodium. Um, but we do that using a lot of herbs and spices. We go through um, amazing amounts of garlic and um, citrus, um, as well as uh, seasonings. So introducing herbs and spices into these uh, recipes is something that everybody has to get used to. So you're not going to see a change overnight from um, using salt to using herbs and spices. Um, it's not the same flavor. It's a very different flavor. Um, I think it's more interesting, more flavorful, um, but it, it doesn't stack up to salt as far as what people are expecting. So one thing that we do to ensure that our recipes have the most flavor, flavor possible um, is we layer the flavors within our recipe. So what I mean by that when I, when I say layering is, um, say you're making um, chili. Well, you're not going to dump all of the ingredients in the pot at the same time. Um, if you did that, you'd have a very flat flavor. Instead, I'm going to take my onions and my garlic, and I'm going to sweat them slowly, and then I'm going to add um, you know, my tomato paste and, and cook that down so it gets a nice nutty flavor, and then start adding things on top of that. Different cuisines that you're making, you're going to have to adjust your processes. Um, cooking American food is very different from cooking Asian food um, or Indian food. Indian food is going to have about 15 steps as far as adding your spices and flavors. Um, but it is very, very key to add the flavors and spices right um, at the right moment within the recipe to, in, to ensure that they get the most flavor out of them. Um, so as Lisa said, we make our own seasoning mixes um, without salt. So we do Italian, we have Greek, we've done a Cajun seasoning, um, and we use these to cook with instead of salt, which adds a lot of flavor um, to our, our cooking. Um, so another thing we, we do is um, we have to look at cheese really hard. Um, as we all know, cheese is one of the most popular um, food components um, in America. No matter you know where you're from, cheese is such a big um, component. So as you see with these cheeses listed here, um, you have to be smart about choosing your cheeses. We make a lot of our cheese sauces in-house, um, and while uh, the norm is like a yellow cheese sauce, um, as you see the American cheese has the most sodium. So I do a mixture of cheeses um, in order to reduce the sodium, keep the color, because that's what the kids are used to, um, the bright yellow color or orange color from the American, but also um, reduce the amount of American that I'm putting in as, uh, and use more mozzarella or Swiss or cheddar or provolone, um, which really does help with the sodium. And I'm able to serve more cheese variety 
on the menu using um, non-American cheese, which is really great. Um, we use um, Bon Guards currently, but I think that um, we're switching over to Lando Lake. We've had a lot of really great luck um, using Lando Lake cheeses. It seems to melt a lot better. Um, so I've made up some herbs and spice flavor charts that we use in our kitchens. We found them really, really helpful um, with uh, the very thin line of giving your staff um, freedom in, in creating dishes that the kids will like um, and also the balancing the other side of following recipes. So as you see here, um, potatoes, uh, you know, basic potatoes, you could do chili flakes, rosemary, thyme, chives, or garlic. Well, you wouldn't want to do all of those in one recipe. Um, just pick two or three of those. So. Um, if you wanted to do rosemary and garlic with potatoes, that would be delightful, or chives and chili flakes. Um, but this is just a basic um, chart that we use as far as um, adding flavor and personalizing things to people's uh, or individual schools. Um, last but not least is employee buy-in, because we know that if you do not have employee buy-in, you are not going to be able to make the changes that you need to make in order to make your um, your production, your facility um, successful. So we do a lot of culinary training, um, boot camps and such with our um, employees. We focus a lot on knife skills and taste, cooking methods, um, use of equipment, all this sort of thing. So and when you invest in your employees, they have a greater sense of loyalty to the school and what you're doing. Um, and if they're able to create something that uh, tastes good and the, the kids like, it gives them um, an amazing amount of pride and they will do their job well. Um, we have little competitions using our, uh, our uh, staff as not guinea pigs, but um, participants, if you like to call them, uh, to come up with new recipes and new ways to use herbs and spices um, because your employees know your kids better than um, you ever will. And so listening to them um, is going to be uh, really very key to your the success of your operation. So um, with that, I think that we will go into some questions. I think Lisa's going to come on um, and uh, answer some questions with me. Um, so, um, one of the, the questions. Go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. I just want to say I see the first question. It says, "Any recommendations regarding low-sodium cheeses, and which are most palatable?" Well, um, we aren't using low-sodium cheeses. As Sally, as uh, Kelly covered, we're trying to find the lower sodium regular cheeses that we can use in recipes to lower the sodium. If we were to go to the second or third level, we would definitely have to look at that. But we've had issues, especially when we've done pizzas, uh, when we've lowered the fat, and I think the sodium would definitely be an issue, and they probably wouldn't eat our pizza. So we're trying to go about it by using different types of cheese and also cutting down the amount of cheese you can still have the cheese flavor with not as much cheese in the recipe. So, uh, Callie, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I, I think that's great as far as cheese. Uh, one thing I saw in here was Asian food tends to be higher in sodium outside of using hoisin and lower sodium soy sauce. Uh, do you have any other tips? Uh, layering flavor. Uh, we bring in a lot of fresh ginger. We do um, kind of the Asian trifecta, which is um, ginger, garlic, and scallions. Um, we have woks in our high school um, that cook food very quickly. Um, we do a lot of dried chili flake um, and, and just adding um, regular spices to our foods. The thing is, is when we're making these recipes, um, we taste it at every single step of the way uh, to ensure uh, consistency, to see if anything needs to be balanced depending on the age of the spice or whatever um, and, and uh, you know going on from there. So it's all about tasting. So okay, um, I've I, got another question. Um, we are self op. Uh, there was a question about that. Um, we do our own child nutrition service. And then pickles, getting a lot of high marks because of probiotic effects and I mentioned that 
we're cutting them out. I know we have tried pickling our own uh, products, and that's worked really well. And that way, you can control the amount of sodium. You don't have to use sodium, but use other other uh, items to to have that pickling effect. Did you want to mention anything on that, Callie? Uh, no, the, the main thing on that is to rinse after you pickle. Um, and pickling shouldn't be something that everyone's scared of. It's really easy and fast. Um, and, and there are recipes out there for lower um, salt pickling. You can do a quick pickle, which uses less salt. So if you want to look at pickling yourself, definitely look for a quick pickle recipe. Um, the other, uh, there's another question about using tomato sauces. Um, Lisa, do you want to touch on our specs for lower sodium uh, tomatoes? Well, low, low sodium uh, is considered 140 milligrams or less, and when we write our specifications, we uh, will specify uh, if that's an item we want to have lower sodium, we want to see a 140 milligram or less sodium product, and we ask our vendors to write actually on our bid uh, how much their products have. That way we've got it right in front of us. We also ask for the labels, but uh, it helps us in making a decision on which we will award to as far as uh, if it meets our specs. And if, it, if it's a product that doesn't taste good and our kids won't like, like I said, if it's not a high quality product, you can't make it a high quality product if it doesn't start out that way. So we, we look at, um, first of all, is it going to be accepted? And then uh, is it a value? And and then will it meet into our, our sodium requirements. Okay. And, um, you, and I know that our, our chefs have added a lot of different herbs, fresh herbs and dried herbs into our tomato products to add flavor. Exactly. Um, I think that's all the time we have. We will go ahead and uh, hand it over to Misha. Hello everyone, my name is Misha James, I'm the Nutrition Services Director with the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk with you guys today and to also hear from the other school districts because they just gave us a ton of great ideas that I'm looking forward to incorporating into our program. So um, just a little bit about Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. So we're a tri-city district. We have um, the city of Monterey as well as the city of Seaside and Marina. We um, have a department of 75 employees. We have 23 active sites and um, one being our central or our pack out kitchen as it's currently um, labeled and two child care centers, 12 elementary, three middle, four high schools and then our central warehouse. We currently have two externally funded programs which is the fresh fruit and vegetable program and that one has been um, widely successful at the sites where we have it because it's an opportunity for the students to be introduced to fruit and vegetables that either they haven't seen or tasted before and it also gives them the opportunity to um, just have a different appreciation for fresh fruits and vegetables. It's exciting to um, to see their faces as we talk to them about the fruits and the vegetables and certain things that um, they didn't even know existed, that carrots actually had greens at the top of them. So that's been really fun. We run um, our after-school snack program as well as the CACFP supper program through some of our sites. And then we participate in the seamless summer feeding. For um, the statistics for our district, we currently have 10,575 students enrolled. We serve about 8, um, 850,000 meals per year, and that includes um, breakfast and lunch. We have um, 7,800 meals and snacks served daily and we're a 66% free and reduced um, district. 30% breakfast and 40% lunch participation so we definitely um, as as I'm sure a lot of us we're you know really looking to um, expand on the participation and increase that and all of that comes through the food and different things that the students get excited about. And then we also have um, a la carte through our middle and high schools and that um, helps us to generate some revenue that we can put back into the program um, as it relates to food and um, supplies and equipment and things of that nature. So 
Putting sodium in perspective, so this is um, kind of the approach we took as far as really getting the staff to understand the reason for it. So as Erica already discussed um, in the previous um, slide presentation, is just discussing what the target one goals are as far as lunch and breakfast are concerned for the sodium. And then also looking at the dietary guidelines for Americans for 2015-2020. And then really talking to them about the impact of sodium on the students and why it is that it's extremely important that we pay attention to that. So this quote um, was very, um, is something that we use often and since a lot of our employees have children um, themselves and many of them are um, students in our district, it really helped um, that they understood from a nutrition perspective why this is important and why it should be important to us and the community that we serve. So nearly nine in 10 children eat more sodium than recommended. One in six have raised blood pressure. So this, you know, this obviously is a very important issue and it's something that we take very seriously and where we can affect that obviously through our department is in the food that we serve to the students or offer to the students. So how are we working to meet the sodium guidelines? So we have salad bars, which have been um, widely successful. We have salad bars in 15 of our 23 sites. We are looking at ways to incorporate the salad bars in the remaining sites that currently don't have them. We, our central, our pack out kitchen um, does entrees for our elementary, our child care, our elementary and our middle schools, as well as the vegetable sides. So this, um, and I'll get into that, this is where we're talking about the scratch cooking versus um, using a lot of the processed foods and things like that. Our high schools cook, um, scratch cook through the high schools. We look for clean ingredient food selections. And so this is something that Lisa spoke about for her district where you really looking at the quality of the food and, and what that quality offers in terms of the nutritional profile. Menu variety and product selection are key. And then organic versus, well not versus, but organic natural um, selections for the students. And I do have some slides that we'll get into later to discuss each of these points more specifically. And then our culinary specialist, which is similar to Callie's position as an executive chef, but the um, culinary specialist really plays a role in terms of assisting with that staff buy-in, recipe development, and really helping us to tailor um, any of the scratch cooking, as well as if we buy kind of like speed, speed scratch items where we may buy something that's already, um, you know, produced a burrito, and then we may add things to it in order to enhance the flavor while at the same time keeping the sodium down. So for salad bars, as I already said, we um, have them in eight of our 12 elementary schools, one of our three middle schools, and actually we just got two of our three middle schools now, and then three of our four high schools. And the benefits of the salad bar include that we can offer fresh fruits and vegetables. It's colorful, and it kind of demonstrates that rainbow that we want the students to select from. It allows for personalization, which is really important, especially when we consider that one of our regulations and one of our guidelines is that the students have to take that fruit um, or vegetable with their meal. And we all know that when we're told, you know, adults, children, we're all the same. When we're told to do something, all of a sudden our mentality about doing it shifts. So by offering the salad bar and having a wide um, selection or, you know, a very varied selection of um, produce, then the students um, in having to choose something at least get to choose something that, that they will want to eat. Um, and then there's the opportunity for nutrition education with the salad bar. Again, when, you know, just visually looking at the salad bar and we have that rainbow there, um, it's an opportunity for us to have some fun with the students and talk with them about fresh produce and why it's important that they eat that. So we have one of our students here that we got permission to um, to take a photo of and to use. And basically, I love the salad bar. I get to choose what I want to eat just like grown-ups do. And that is something that, you know, as grown-ups, we may not 
think about it now, but we all know that when we were young, we wanted to be older and get to do the things that the adults got to do. So um, th that was really fun and to hear her, you know, kind of make that comparison that the salad bar allows her to feel a little bit more grown up. So with the central kitchen entrees and sides, we make close to 10,000 meals and sides weekly through our packout kitchen, um, and that includes 3,500 to 4,000 entrees, and that's mainly um, lunch. We don't really do uh, breakfast through our packout kitchen, but that is something that we're looking toward in the new school year. Um, 4,800 vegetable and fruit sides, and then we also have 825 extras, which go toward our after school programs or theme meal desserts and things like that. So this allows for ingredient control and the use of herbs and spices to build flavor profiles, which you um, heard Callie discuss in the previous presentation. And this is really important because when things are cooked from scratch, then we can monitor what goes in it, we can taste it along the way, we can add more, you know, acid from citrus fruits and things like that to kind of mimic that salt taste without adding salt to it. And then just creating a fresher tasting meal, something more home cooked for the students um, and giving them something different than what they may get on their own or what they may get at home. So this was a quote um, from actually one uh, from the culinary specialist that the reality is that school cooks are a bunch of rocks, food rock stars. And this was great. And what you're looking at here is our central kitchen, um, some of our central kitchen and pack out staff. And on the um, left side of the screen there, we have a Chipotle chicken burrito that um, we made um, for the students and that's just like a nice cold slaw that complemented the spiciness of the chicken and then um, they're making on the right side is some chicken chow mein and again as, as Callie already mentioned it was really about the herbs, dry herbs, um, fresh herbs, garlic, and different things like that to just really bring out the flavor of the food without having to use the salt and without compromising that flavor. So scratch cooking at the high schools, so 550 breakfast meals um, prepared daily and then 800 lunch entrees. And just as I discussed with the previous slide, the ability to do the scratch cooking allows for ingredient control, the use of herbs and spices to build flavor profiles, and then just a fresher tasting food, a home cooked appeal that um, really helps the students to want to come back into the cafeteria to, you know, to eat what we're preparing. And so this is just some pictures from our high school. So this is um, our version of a margarita pizza. So um, fresh basil, the tomatoes, and then the cheese with the whole grain crust. And then our on the right side is um, a Chipotle fish taco. Um, we're um, one of the schools that participates in the Bay de Tray, so we take advantage of the um, fish that is um, local here to our region and utilize that fish in recipes for our students. And again, just using acids and herbs and just combinations of different vegetables, which can also add flavor without adding um, sodium. So. Cleaner ingredients, and this one is is big. So the use of natural and or orga organic products, you know, as, as far as affordability, but really paying attention to the ingredient labels and what we kind of of say is real foods versus chemistry projects. And a motto that we really have within our district is um, if we wouldn't eat it, then we definitely don't want to serve it to the students. And so you'll see here Miller's, which is a great hot dog brand, so this is nothing against Miller's because we do, and you'll see in the next slide that we still continue to use Miller's. But when we look at this particular Miller's hot dog, we see a higher sodium. And then we also see, when we look at the ingredient label, a lot of things that either we're not exactly sure how to pronounce or things that even more importantly, we would not be able to go into our own grocery stores and buy. And that's one of the biggest things that we look at when we're um, pulling new items um, for the menu and different things like that is, 
you know, if, if we were to take this ingredient list and walk up and down our aisles in a grocery store, could we buy everything on this ingredient list? And if we can't, then that, let a, that lets us know that it's something that is, is more manufactured and, and moving away from the whole food concept that we want to have for the food we serve. So here um, are some pictures of some cleaner ingredient labels. So again, here's a Miller's hot dog, but this one is the all-natural uncured Miller's hot dog. And while the sodium is very similar, we can see that the fat is less, that the cholesterol is less, and then when we look at the ingredient label itself, these are all things that are recognizable to us. And then on the right side, we have an Adele's chicken hot dog that has been really popular. In this situation, the sodium is 70 milligrams less and then again when we look at the ingredient label we see items that we or you know words that we actually recognize and could get at our, our local grocery stores if we want it. So variety and selection are the spices of life and so we offer multiple entrees um, daily which helps us to reduce the weekly average sodium as well. So so at our K through eight sites, we offer three entrees, and at our um, high schools, we offer five to eight entrees daily. And this really helps, again, to help with the weekly, as well as giving them a variety of choices, so that way they come into the cafeteria and have a selection of things to choose from. And then product selection is really key, and um, Lisa and Callie spoke about this. So frozen versus canned. Um, a tremendous um, decrease in sodium from the frozen to the canned products. Fresh versus processed, things that can be made um, at, on the site or even, like we said, speed scratching where you're taking a part of something that's already made and then adding things to it that you yourself have produced, whether it's a sauce or different things like that. And then natural whole foods versus, you know, the manufactured foods or heavily um, overly processed foods. So our culinary specialist is a trained chef and what she does is helps with the development of recipes which allows us to offer more scratched um, cooked or speed scratch cooked. She tweaks existing recipes to reduce the sodium through the use of acids and herbs and layering of flavors. She acts as a liaison between the department and the students, so she helps with the nutrition education component of it to the students as well, going out and doing taste tests with the students. And this one is really important because that's the buy-in from the students. They, they see things on the menu that they've had the opportunity to taste, and then they're more likely to come into the cafeteria and get it when it's being offered on that particular day. And then also supports staff training and provides that same nutrition education to the staff, which helps again with that buy-in and the big why we're doing things, because that, that's what's important. When people know why something is being done, then that makes a difference in their um, desire and, you know, want to actually do it. So this is just a picture of the taste test, so test after test after test, and this is where we'll go out to the schools and actually new recipes and have the students taste it and get their opinion on it. So that way we know if this is, you know, a value added, is this worthwhile, will the students eat it? Because at the end of the day, that's what all of this is about, is the students. So we can, you know, create the best recipes in the world, but if the students don't like the flavor and things like that, then it's it's not beneficial. So getting out there and getting their opinion and that way we know, okay, what do we need to tweak? So you kind of liked it, but you felt like it was missing something. Okay, so let's, you know, let's go back to square one and try that again. And so then just is just, you know, a little cartoon that I found that I thought would be fun. All I'm saying is, is you should cut down a bit, so. Thank you all so much. I um, appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you today. And are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then I will pass it back over to Liz. Thank you, Misha. I'd also like to thank our other great panelists for sharing their information and thank our participants for listening in. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements. 
Upcoming TBUP state events are planned in Iowa and Tennessee for July. Be looking this summer for Team Up for School Nutrition Success, designed especially for site managers. And USDA and ICM will present Team Up pre-conference workshops at SNA's ANC in Atlanta in July. Workshops are designated um, for state agency personnel and school nutrition directors. Remember that all of the webinars are recorded and can be viewed on the Team Up for School Nutrition Success website at www.theicn.org slash teamup. We also have state snapshots that provide a summary of Team Up events that are also available on the site. So you can see what happens at a Team Up workshop. I would also like to take this opportunity to mention that in an effort to meet your online training needs, ICN will be launching a brand new e-learning portal to replace its current online training system. The new system will have a fresh new look, it's simple to navigate, and will continue to have a searchable catalog. Certificates will still be available. You can even upload certificates from other trainings you've attended so you can keep all of your documentation in one place. It's mobile friendly and will provide an enhanced online training experience anytime and anywhere. Here's some important information that will help you transition to the new system. Current user profiles and certificate transcripts will not be transferred to the new system, so it's important that you access your account and download the certificates that you wish to keep as soon as possible. To keep you informed, we have created a web page for information concerning the launch. The link provides responses to frequently asked questions and includes instructions for downloading your certificates. We are here to help. If you have any questions or need assistance accessing your profile and certificates, please email the ICN Help Desk at helpdesk at theicn.org or give us a call at the number on the screen. This concludes our Team Up Thursday's webinar. Thanks again for your participation and have a great day.